what's up, everybody? We are here in Arizona for a special interview with our friend, Commissioner of the EEOC, Keith Sonderling. You know him as Chad Sowash. You know me as Joel Cheeseman. Keith, a lot of people don't know you. Give us the 411. They better know Keith. He's been on the show. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're really close to the, uh, the red velvet the red jacket. Velvet, yeah, this this jacket. might be the smoking jacket. Well, it's great there. to be back. I'm Keith Sonderling, Commissioner of the United States Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, but for most HR professionals, just known as the EEOC. Mm-hmm. Uh, we are the federal agency responsible for enforcing all anti-discrimination laws and making sure employees have equal employment opportunities in the workplace. So I like to simplify that. We are the regulator of HR. So everyone in the HR world, we are your government agency watching everything you do and trying to help ensure that you don't discriminate and that all employees and applicants get an equal shot to succeed in the workplace. Educating as well, right? So you're not just here to slap them on the wrist, here to help them out and guide which is you know, one of the reasons why we're talking today, is um, obviously you, when coming on the scene, uh, you jumped into AI very early. I mean, the, this, is, this is pre, you know, pre yeah, this, chat GPT. This isn't the status quo for the yeah. EEOC, right? Yeah. You jumped which, right into which high was, tech. Which, which I thought was interesting because his, his uh, chief, of, um, chief of staff reached out and said, Keith wants to talk about AI. I'm like, wait a minute, what? So you got into this early, what got you to this, to, to this point, even again, before the chat GPTs or anything like that? Well, there's a few reasons. Think about as HR professionals, right? And, and the EEOC, very similar. We're always um, giving our efforts on where to spend, whether it's enforcement or compliance assessment on what's going on in the news. Yeah. So um, it, it's just very typical. So right now we try to focus on one thing and what happens, you have a big news story. So let's go back 10 years. Uh, you know, there's a lot of focus on how do we prevent age discrimination in the workplace? and then making strides there. And then the Me Too movement happens, right? Mm -hmm. So it was all sexual harassment prevention all the time, where companies needed to focus on making sure they had sexual harassment policies, Mm -hmm. firing the CEOs who were sexually harassing that would never be able to get fired before. So that we focus on that. And then you know, everything happens with the women's soccer team and pay equity becomes the hottest yeah. thing in the news, right? Yeah. So yeah. then we have to focus on that. Then COVID happens. And then everything with accommodations related to COVID and vaccine. And then you know, some of the social justice movements within the workplace happen yeah. post George Floyd. So then HR has to go there. So that's the way HR is, just by the nature of the job. That's the way the EEOC is. Mm-hmm. Always sort of, I don't want to say distracted, but always kind of pivoting to what's in the news. So I said, you the know, shiny ball syndrome. Right. So how do we actually prevent something from happening like we've seen before? Mm-hmm. How do we focus our efforts? How do we say we'll always have something in the news pushing us in different directions? But how do we slow down and see what the biggest issue is going to be in the future? Mm-hmm. And how do we put resources there in advance to make sure whatever that issue is, it's actually going to work and not cause discrimination? So when I got to the EEOC, I started reaching out to HR professionals, start reaching out to um, lawyers in this area and say, you know, what are those futuristic issues that are going to be happening within HR? Uh-huh. And that's how I was able to talk to, you know, guys like you, you know, people who didn't normally interact with the EEOC because overwhelmingly everybody said technology in the workplace is going to be the number one issue, not only facing the workforce, yeah. but facing human resource departments. So I had to dive into exactly what that meant. Mm-hmm. And then I stumbled upon the world of HR technology, where you guys have been living for a very long time. And, you know, trying to understand it, trying to get my arms around it has been a process. And I still continue to learn because, as you both know, um, as everyone out there knows as well, from A to Z of the employment relationship, from A to Z of HR functions, there are some technology and software out there promising to do it better than humans have done it. Yes. And that is why I've been interested in it. And that's why I've been spending my time in there, because that's where our focus but, I mean, But humans haven't really done a good job in the first place. So, I mean, this is, I mean, there's some, there's some good and bad, right? So we, we, we're talking about how, you know, AI could prospectively have bias and so on and so forth. Well, I mean, we've had bias since, you know, humans were created, for goodness sake. Which so. led to the creation of our agency. You know, yeah. our agency was created out of the civil rights movement in the 1960s after Martin Luther King um, marched in Washington, D.C. It led mm. to the creation of the Civil Rights Act, which created the EEOC. So since then and before then, there's obviously been a issue with bias in the workplace, whether it's hiring, whether it's firing, whether it's promotions. Um, so, you know, we have to look at it now when technology is being thrown into that equation. Well, what have we been dealing with? since the 1960s, since these laws 
were yeah. enacted. Yeah. And that's human decision making. And that's sort of the struggle I think a lot of HR professionals are dealing with, a lot of corporate regulators, um, p corporate buyers of these products are trying to deal right. with as well. Yeah. They're saying that, okay, here's a new technology promising to help us do what we've been doing. And because it's new, we don't understand it, and we don't understand how we're gonna implement it, but let's, let's take a step back and say, well, what are your processes and procedures right now related to human decision making? Yes. And you'll find um, that there's not many of those processes and procedures to begin with, and now we're gonna put a heightened level on um, the AI, and there's good yeah. reasons to do so. So, ah. you know, to your point, it's really interesting. We're saying, well, what are we dealing with now if we're not dealing with technology? Well, I love the piggybacking on that because uh, your statements about Me Too and George Floyd, you make it sound like a dog chasing its own tail. But in, in knowing you the last few years, Chad's point about the, the historical foundation that you've laid is built to handle really anything that technology or pop culture or whatever throws at you, right? Like you have a North Star. It's just a matter of taking what's going around and keeping on that main uh, foundation that you had when it was first built, yes? Yes, and it's easy for us because we're dealing with some of the most fundamental civil rights we have in the United States, and that's the ability to enter and thrive in the workforce, to provide your to, for your family mm -hmm. without being discriminated against. So yes, that's a really great point in the sense where no matter what the issue is, no matter what, whether it's technology, whether it's humans, whether it's the news, whether it's COVID, right? We have our guiding star, star, which is the Civil Rights Act. And we always look back to that on, on where we're putting our priorities and what the remedies are going to be for complying with it or not complying with those laws. What are the main differences between a case maybe in the 80s versus what you would deal with today? Because although they are similar, I'm sure there are, there are variations that make them different. We just see shifts in what the claims are. And those shifts, you know, just change per, you know, decade, per generation, per workforce, mm -hmm. you know, generations in the workforce. And, you know, today we're dealing with types of claims that 10 years ago were very, very low, such as, you know, disability claims. Disability claims are continuously the number one cause of underlying discrimination in the United States. But even within the last five to 10 years, the types of claims mm -hmm. within that disability realm are shifting from more traditional physical medical so disabilities. It used to be I can't get through the front door. To now mental health. <laughs> yeah. Right? And, and employers were really geared very well for having to deal with issues where I can't get through the front door, or I need yeah. an accommodation yeah. related to being able to uh, work, you know, whether it's an adaptive device, et cetera. Now it's shifting to mental health mm. and all the issues with anxiety, depression, and PTSD in the workforce, which we have to deal with as well. So I think you, know, you have to look at it per generation in the workforce, mm. per um, trends that are occurring outside of the workplace that are gonna certainly have a large impact within the workplace, and that it's continually shifting, but that's exactly what HR professionals have to deal with too. So I really, it's taken a different approach. Instead of reacting to that, saying, oh, the Me Too movement happened, now we need to send our federal investigators just to deal with yeah. um, sexual harassment yeah. claims. Yeah. You know, with technology, I'm looking at, well, let's be proactive. Let's tell everybody in this ecosystem, which is much different than we've ever seen before mm -hmm. from the federal government, on what their roles are in each point. Because you know, it, the, the, the world now of HR technology is much different than the EEOC is used to dealing with, and from you guys as HR professionals, because we have a lot of different people in that equation. So, you know, we start about the amount of money, and I know you guys follow this closely, being yeah. invested into HR technology. Yeah. Well, we need to make sure that those who are investing, the, the VCs or private equities that are investing in these technologies, have enough information where they're not gonna give money to create a product that's going to discriminate, right? right. And they speak a different language than we do at the government and then HR professionals. Mm -hmm. And then the entrepreneurs who are willing to go out and try to solve an issue when it comes to either removing bias in the workforce, making it more efficient, et cetera, whatever these products are designed to be, that they understand what the rules of the role are because you know, if they're able to develop these products, a lot of them you know, weren't trained in HR. They were trained in actually how to create AI and machine learning and all this. So right, they're speaking right. a different language than us. And then in the middle, um, and I'm not saying the worst position, but let's just assume being in the middle comes with, uh, you know, being hit from all directions. Oh, yeah. You know, those are gonna be the companies who are looking to buy these products and trying to implement these products, right? So they need that, to be able to understand what it, uh, 
questions they need to ask to the vendor. Yeah. And then they need to understand what to do internally. And then finally, and most importantly, and I think we'll all agree, is gonna be the employees and applicants that are going to be subject to these tools.